Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. Today we go back to the middle of the 19th century. We're in Paris. Twenty years have passed since Napoleon Bonaparte ruled half of Europe. The peasants are still poor, but the privileged are fewer. Changes are in the air. Not, however, in what people lived by, believed in. To be trusted is still a greater compliment than to be loved. To be faithful is the rock on which all marriages are founded. A man might look elsewhere, but a woman never. Madame, I wish to know, is there someone hiding here? No, monsieur. Supposing I were to open that closet door to see for myself? Husband, if you should find no one in there, all will be over between us. You threaten me. If there is no trust between us, There can be no marriage. Swear to me there is no one in there, and I shall believe you. Swear. I swear. Our mystery drama, The Countess, adapted from the Honoré de Balzac classic, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Jerry Keene and stars Marion Seldes, and Roberta Maxwell. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Today, our guide to a strange mystery is the celebrated French author Honoré de Balzac. It is said he wrote from life, peopled his novels and stories with his friends and neighbors. Certainly, a no more extraordinary couple begin his story than the beautiful lady and handsome gentleman of middle years seated in a left bank cafe early one morning. Wrapped in each other, they do not notice they are being observed by young Charles, a student at the university who frequents that cafe for his breakfast. The proprietor sets down a small cup of coffee and wipes his hands on his apron. Bonjour, Charles. I brought you your usual. Thank you. Uh, Who are they? Hmm? Who are who? That beautiful woman and that man with the tanned skin and the gray hair at the corner table. Oh, Uh, monsieur and madame have only just moved into the neighborhood. I've not yet learned their names. (laughs) I must say, it's at their age to be holding hands and... Looking into each other's eyes. Oh, <laughs> you think love is only for the very young? Eh? 21 years like you, Jean? <laughs> of course not, but uh, that woman, I, I know her. Somewhere long ago, uh, something... Uh... Hey, 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 it's not so good to drink your coffee so quickly. Are you off already? Oh, I must. I'm late for class. I, I wish... I wish I could meet them, the the lady particularly. (laughs) She's old enough to be your mother, mon petit. My mother? But not likely. I have been an orphan for as long as I can remember. Au revoir. Did you see that young man, Carlos? The one who just ran out of the cafe? Yes. Don't be angry with me, but... I feel I, I must leave here right away. My darling, we have only just sat down. Oh, do not argue. I shall tell you all when we're back at the hotel. I love this view. I don't think one chimney has changed on one rooftop in the last 20 years. (laughs) Did you bring out some bread for the pigeons? Bread for the... (laughs) Josephine, you didn't drag me back to our room to talk about feeding the pigeons. I'm sorry, Carlos. It was... Oh, it's so hard to explain. Is it the same trouble? Yes. Oh, I wish I could help myself. 
that boy. There is always a boy wherever we go. But what can I do? Every time I see a young man of that age, I'm heartbroken. Please. I hoped returning to Paris where our happiness really began would remind us only of the best memories. It uh, was a mistake. I'm being stupid. And it was never like me to be stupid. I've kept it all inside so long. To myself, so many years. Perhaps I... that was wrong. I am your husband. We came to Paris to be happy. I must tell you everything. Today. Now, Carlos, so that we can... Be. I have never asked you to. Now, listen. Be quiet. I was as young as that boy in the cafe. Younger, probably. Eighteen. My first husband, Comte de Meret, he was much older than I. How tall he was. Everyone said, what a handsome couple. Well, I didn't know I was so innocent. I didn't know he was tall. Only in centimeters. In everything else, he was small. So very small and petty and degrading, too. It is I who wish it, my dear Josephine. There are certain codes of conduct expected of the titled. You are the daughter of a count, and you married a count. We are someone. The slightest shadow, the slightest familiarity with the townspeople is out of place. But I only said good morning when the butcher tipped his hat to me in the church. Surely you don't Innocent mind if I... Innocent to you, perhaps. But I need not tell you what familiarity breeds. There are certain liberties a lady of your station cannot indulge in. You may not go rowing on the lake. You may not walk in the public park where you might be seen by the riffraff. You may not, by so much as an eyebrow, acknowledge the presence of any stranger in church or in the town. But surely in church we're all equal before God. Everything I've learned teaches me that. Madame, we will hear no more of this. Now you may ring for your maid, dress yourself for the day, and let me see some progress on that embroidery when I return. When will that be? Tais-toi. Josephine, do you really expect me to hold myself accountable to you? I'm joining the Duke de Lauragois. We shall no doubt ride over to the Prince de Masson's and perhaps a little wine. I'm, I'm spoiling you, my dear. Don't become accustomed to asking how I spend my time. If I wish you to know, I shall inform you. Yet you expect to know all about me. I not only expect, I demand. Since you demand... May I tell you something you do not know about me? Well, then be quick about it. We are going to have a baby. Is that true? I'm afraid so. Well, why afraid? I shall have the best midwife and doctor for you. A baby. So be it. Nothing to fear. Oh, a figure of speech, which has much truth in it. Wait until I tell the Duke and Masson. <laughs> They'll be envious. I dare say they'd like an heir... But I am the only one around here able to produce one. <laughs> right? There, there, little one. Please stop crying, please. Rosalie. Yes, madame. How is he? He seems so unhappy. <laughs> Why do I ask you? You're not getting married. Oh, now, 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 little one, what's the matter? Of course, he needs changing, that is all. Oh, how clever of you. How did you know? We were 11 children, madame. When I was 10, I took care of my two baby brothers while my mother and father worked in the fields. How proud they would have been to see me attending to madame in this great chateau. Oh, but have they been dead a long time? The plague took them the year I came to be the scullery maid for the Count, your father. A sad year for all of us. My parents were also taken. Wealth and title does not stay the hand of God. I miss my parents also. Oh, is he not beautiful? See, he's going to sleep. Such a funny face. Ravish! Run out and tell this table boy to rub down my horse well. Well, ladies, how is it with you? Ah, the child is sleeping for a change. Uh, Rosalie, fetch me some claret. Yes, sir. <laughs> what a day for a hunt. A magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Oh, now you've wakened him. Oh, little 
one. Shh, there's nothing to be frightened of. That baby's becoming a nuisance. You've been drinking. Of course I've been drinking. And it's running away with your tongue. The baby is taking entirely too much precedence in this household. Too much. Too much. Well, here is your... Uh... Oh, he's asleep on the floor. Well, we must try to put him to bed. Oh. Help me, but... Oh, I can't budge him. Oh, I can't... Nor can I. He's, he's such a big man. Three o'clock in the afternoon, and look at him. He sickens me. Rosalie, let us take the baby in its pram and go into the public park. I've never been to the park. Shall we do that? Like you mean leave the master lying here on the floor? Well, why not? <laughs> he came to it by rights. Oh, how wonderful it is to walk like anyone else under the trees with my baby. How free. At home, I feel like such a prisoner. Madame is being very frank with me. I am only her maid. Oh, who else do I have to talk with? You're a woman, Rosalie. My only friend. When my father was alive, our chateau always rang with music and laughter. But when the plague took him and Mama, it took all his friends, and I was suddenly completely alone. Well, can we sit on this bench? Certainly, madame. And then, one day at church, this tall man spoke to me. He knew Papa, he said. And could he offer me his condolences? Oh, how sympathetic he was then. How kind. And I was lonely. He pursued me, and at last we, we were married. Where did all his kindness go? You know, money can harm more than it can help, Rosalie. I beg your pardon, ladies. For the impertinence. Uh, yes, monsieur. What is it? I have lost my way. I am unfamiliar to this park, and I would like to find the location of the prefect of police. The prefect of police? Uh, no, I, I have never had occasion to go there. Are you an escaped convict who wishes to give himself up, monsieur? <sighs> you are joking, are you not? How did you know? You are? No, not, not a convict, no. I am a prisoner of war. One of your Napoleon's victims. I am Don Bagos de Feredia. But I know of the family. My uncle was ambassador at the court of King Joseph. Bagos de Feredia is a noble family. I was in Madrid when Napoleon took the city. And now, if you please, the uh, prefect of police, I have given my word to report every day while I am required to lodge in your town. Oh, you see the iron gate at the end of the path? Ah, uh, see. Uh, go through it, and you will be on the Avenue Saint-Marie. Turn to your left some 50 meters, and where the French flag is flying is the Marie and the police. Ah, thank you. And I hope I have not disturbed the peace of your lovely day. God be with you. Good day. <sighs> Well, what did you think of the gentleman? So, uh, so quiet, so, so noble. Did you notice his eyes? Like two flames. Madame, you look pale. Are you not well? Oh, yes, I'm well. I'm very well. The sun is going down. We should return. Strange. I would have said the sun is rising. Pardon? No matter. Yes, we must go home. Ah, how can I sleep with that endless caterwauling? Josephine, Josephine, wake up. What is it? Do you not you hear? Where is the nurse? Oh, I I'll, I'll go and look. The nurse had to go to visit her sick mother. Sick mother. I've had enough. And Josephine, tomorrow I wish you to move all my clothes upstairs to your father's suite. Bed, shirts, boots, everything. It was good of you to attend Mass with me this morning, Rosalie. No, I should go more often. This is our chapel. We sit here. Oh, look, madame. Is not that the young Spanish grandee we met in the park? He must be very accomplished. 
He's reading the book. But why do you say accomplished? The book is in Latin, madame. Oh, madame. He has raised his eyes. He's looking at us. Oh, goodness. He's smiling. Oh, madame, you are smiling too. Shh. Let us be silent and pray. Perhaps our prayers will be answered. The great French writer, Honoré de Balzac, upon whose tale this account is based, once wrote, Cruelty and fear shake hands together. Cruelty and fear together. That may explain the strange viciousness the Count demonstrates towards his young wife, which oiled the wheels of fate towards what happened next. I shall return in a moment to bring you Act Two. What could be more tragic for a young woman of the 19th century than to feel life has cheated her and there is no way out? Divorce, separation, what we in our century take for granted was unheard of in those days. And then, to nail her to her unhappiness, a stranger enters her life whose eyes, she tells us, speak of fire. To feel, to love, to devote oneself to someone is the life of a woman, says our author Balzac. But not to be able to love. Is there any escape Let's find out. Do you remember the first day we walked in this park, Rosalie? Two months ago. The leaves are turning now. You were wheeling the baby that day, not I. And there's the bench we sat on. Madame, do you know that every time we pass this spot, you always point to it and say, there is the bench we sat on. <laughs> do I? <laughs> oh, how sad I was that day. I thought my life was over. You've been such a good friend, Rosalie. Oh. Can we turn here? I keep forgetting. Uh, the gates are this way, the boathouse that way. What is the hour? A uh, little before two. We are in time. The usual one hour, madame? Yes. The usual precious one hour. We have walked it out to the minute, the little count and I, uh, very slowly. Two full circles, and that is an hour. <laughs> uh, we shall be uh, waiting at the big chestnut tree. But I, I don't see his boat. What time did you say it was? Just two, madame. Well, where is he? But he's always here, waiting. Uh, I, I must go and talk to the boatkeeper. Perhaps he's seen him. Well, is that wise? You will have to part your veil to talk to him. You may be recognized. I'll be careful. Ah, the veiled lady. Your uh, brother left word he cannot come today. It's a pity, for I saved a very fine little boat for you, even the oars are new. He left no other message about Friday, perhaps? Message? Message? No, no. Let me see. Nothing? No. Well, no, no, I think, I think there was something, but uh, what was it? Oh, I beg of you, please try to remember. Uh. Oh, yes, your brother. He left a package for you. I know just where I put it. Ah, here. Here it is. It's only a little package. Well, thank you very much. Now, if you should ever wish to leave anything in my care for your brother, I'd be only too happy. I must go. Thank you. You are most welcome, my lady. Oh, uh, what a Friday. Should I reserve a boat for you? Three o'clock as usual? Rosalie! Rosalie! Wait, wait! Madame, what is it? He left this. Oh, I'm sorry to breath. Wait a he left this with the boat keeper. Oh! Oh! Oh, how beautiful. Crucifix. What does that mean? Uh, th that, that black wood, what is it? Ebony. Christ is in silver. Where will you hide it? Hide it? Oh, I should say not. I shall, I shall place it on the wall above my bed. Oh, but supposing the count, will he not ask where it came from? Oh, I'll make up a story. Well, come now. We have almost an hour to enjoy the park and think wishfully. I shall walk the pram, Rosalie. And dream about my friend with the fiery eyes. And you shall dream about your fiancé. 
Happy dreams. Dreams? While we are awake? Those are the best kind. Labiche, where are you? Ah, Rosalie, where is everybody? A bed, sir. It is very late. Oh, is it? How's your mistress? She's not well. She remained in her room all day, in bed. Did she not get up at all? It is the same sickness. Ah. Did the doctor come? He can find nothing. You had old Boyer here? Is she asleep? Perhaps I should go in and have a I would not suggest she be disturbed. Very well. I'm deucedly tired myself. Here, taper this candle, will you? I can light my own way upstairs. Good night, sir. What is... What? What is that? She's awake. Good evening, my dear. I thought I heard you laugh. Oh, I... Why are you out of bed and fully dressed? It's such a beautiful gown, no less. Madam, why at ten o'clock at night are you wearing such finery and a necklace and earrings? You're, you're very late. Am I too late now? Tell me, is that closet door moving or is it my imagination? What? The closet door, madam. It seems to me I saw it closing. Is it your maid? I was speaking to her a moment ago. Rosalie? Are you in there? I thought you told me your mistress had gone to bed. Rosalie! There's no one in that closet. Did I hear you ring, madame? Ah, Rosalie. I could have sworn you were inside that closet. You wish me to help you undress? No, she does not. I will help her undress. You can go, Rosalie. I, I shall put in my curl papers myself. Uh, as you wish, madame. Good night. Good night, sir. What is it, husband? Why do you walk around so? Do you have bad news? Are you ill? Madam, there is someone in that closet. No, monsieur. Well, then, let's see for ourselves. <gasps> Your hand stays me. Why? Husband, if you should find no one in there, all will be at an end between you and me. As you wish. No, Josephine, I will not open it. In either event, we should be parted forever. What further reassurances do I need? Ah, that crucifix over the bed. I cannot remember seeing this here before. I know you are a Sunday churchgoer, madam. I've often heard you pray before retiring. Then, swear to me on this crucifix that there is no one in there and I shall believe you. I will never open that door. I swear it. Louder. Take it in your hands and repeat. I swear before God that there is nobody in that closet. I swear before God that there is nobody in that closet. That will do. Hmm. Fine piece of work. Very artistically wrought. Where did you find it? At Duvivier's. He, uh, when the Spanish prisoners of war came through town some time ago, he bought it from an old monk. Did you know? Ring for your maid. Well, do as I say. But I don't need her. I can undress myself. Oh, so I notice. Your miraculous recovery. Ring again. Ah, Rosalie, come over here. I know that Giron wishes to marry you, but that you've told him no until he becomes a master mason. And that means the mayor, a good friend of mine, must sign the license. I want you to go to Giron's house and fetch him. At this hour? Yes, 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 without delay. Tell him to bring his trowel and tools from the coach house and bring bricks and mortar here into this room. Tell him to speak to no one and make certain no one sees him coming here. If you do this, I can tell you, my girl, your fiancé will become a master mason tonight. I think you have enough bricks, Giron, and the mortar seems also in good order. Now, 
I want both you and Rosalie to listen carefully. You see that closet door recessed in the wall? I want it bricked up. Solidly. Understand? Now, Giron, tomorrow morning I shall arrange for you to have a passport which will enable you to go abroad. England, South America, wherever you should choose. Giron, I will give you 6,000 francs for your journey. I will give you an additional 6,000 on condition you will speak to no one, ever, of what you have built for me tonight. We shall arrange, as first step, to meet in Paris when I shall give you Rosalie 10,000 francs upon your marriage to Giron. This, too, on the condition you hold your tongue. If not, no wedding gift. Now, begin. Rosalie, uh, uh, come and brush my hair. I want not a word spoken in this room. I'm going to fetch some wine. I shall leave this door to the hall open. I warn you. Rosalie, I'll give you a thousand francs a year if you will tell Giron to leave a crack there at the bottom. Of course. Madame, friends take no money. Ah, what's that? Someone speak? Oh, it would go faster. If Rosalie would assist her fiancé, I, I will stir the mortar. <laughs> Very fine work, Jerome. Mm, eight o'clock. <laughs> Splendid morning. Very careful, good work. I shall certainly attest to the mayor you are a qualified master mason. Merci, monsieur. I'm off to the mayor. As Giron, come with me. We shall get your certificate and passport. Oh, the crucifix. May I borrow it for a few hours, my dear? Eh, uh, Duvivier's, you said, is where you bought it? He will find out. What does it matter? It will take time to go there and more time at the mayor's. Now, quick, Rosalie, there's a pickaxe leaning against the garden wall. Go and fetch it. Oh, oh can one hear this? To reassure myself, all is well. Oh, can this be heard? All will soon be well. The pickaxe, madame. Good upright, loose where he left a crack. Rosalie, water down that mortar. And afterwards, we'll, we'll replace everything. I watched Giron. I know how to do it. Good. One brick already pried loose. Oh, it'll go quickly now. <laughs> how surprised the Count would be. Could he see me now? Surprised? <gasps> oh, no, madame. I'm not surprised at all. Oh, God. Lay the Countess upon her bed. Gracious, would you look at that, Giron? There appears to be a slight defect in your masterly accomplishment. You were promised the position of Master Mason. I would immediately fall to and make masterly repairs, especially if one's very future depended upon it. Yes, the Count had tricked his wife, laid a trap for her, baited it, and she had been caught in it. However, never underestimate the self-control of a desperate woman. Josephine, the young countess, had far from given in or given up. Stay with us for the extraordinary third act, which will begin in just a moment. The errors of women spring almost always from their faith in the good or their confidence in the true. Think about that. And had you known such a woman as a young countess, could you not, in your heart, forgive her? In the light of today, hers was but an innocent friendship with a mysterious Spanish nobleman. The Count de Marais, unforgiving, unforgetting, was a prisoner of his own revenge. As Act Three begins, twenty days have passed. The cat plays with the mouse. Good morning, Josephine. It seems to me you are recovering. You've had a bad time of it. And so I have been a faithful husband all during your indisposition and have never left your side. 
I... Uh, uh, you have been here, yes. I, uh, I, I remember, but it's so long ago. I forget what it was that happened. <laughs> You're not the only one plagued with forgetfulness. Do you remember old Duvivier, the jeweler? Talk of absent-mindedness. That day you fainted so inexplicably, I had sent for him. Look, I said, this crucifix, I understand you sold it to no, my wife. No, don't, don't, tell, I don't go on. And not I, he said. Very good work, very old, too. Probably from some Spanish nobleman's private chapel. Don't, oh, don't, please. Don't. Now I have good news. I have asked the doctor to pay us a visit, and I'm hopeful he will pronounce you better. Come in. Monsieur le docteur is here. Ah, good. I shall go out to speak with him. Uh, uh, see what your mistress would like for le petit déjeuner. Oh, madame, I'm so glad. Good morning. You look more like yourself today. Rose, what is it? Where is my baby? <gasps> the closet. Shh, shh, madame, <laughs> don't upset yourself. Everything is fine. Where is my baby? Oh, bring him to me. He is being well taken care of. Do not worry. You had a very high fever, madame. We could do nothing. But how long have I been like this? Tomorrow it will be three weeks. And... And the wall Giron made. Oh, madame, it is terrible. All the bricks in place the way he repaired it. Your mind was so troubled. You had no idea what was happening. And where is Giron? He has left the town to keep his part of the bargain. I have... No, none of this. Not since the morning you fainted. The doctor came. He said you should rest. Every day you would wake up and look at the closet, and then you could not get out of bed. Twenty days. Twenty days? Gone from my mind. Where is your fiancé? He was going to leave a little hole for me. I said but... to you, madame, he is abroad. And did you bring me my pickaxe? Hurry, get it. Madame. Uh, uh, tell me about Giron. Is he well? Twelve thousand francs. We could not turn our backs on that. And ten more when we marry. Besides, if we were to tell the authorities, the Count said we would be charged, being accessories to the fact. The fact? What fact? Oh, God in heaven. I cannot go on. I, I don't understand. I can't go on. The doctor is here, Josephine. <laughs> Josephine? Madame la Comtesse? Send him away. Send him away. I don't want to see anybody. Leave her to me, please, Count. And the maid. You, you too, Mademoiselle? Yes, of course. You know best. Tell me, I thought she was on the mend, but she has not changed much in the past few weeks. Irrational. I cannot think what possessed you, Count Desmarais. You should have sent for me long before. Now, go, both of you. Y yes, certainly, Doctor. <laughs> Madame Josephine, you remember me, Dr. Boyer? I attended your dear father and mother. You can trust me. Madame, medicine can only go so far. It is you who must help us. And in that way, we can help you. But I'm so afraid, Doctor. I do not wish to remain in this house. Afraid of what? Afraid of my husband. I must leave here. Will you help me? Oh, you are too weak now, Josephine. When you get your strength back, that is all that should concern you. You see it. The wall. Those bricks, they're moving. Look at them. I cannot look anymore. They move when I look. Oh, please, help me. Help me. Here. Come closer. Over my head is that crucifix. Take it from the wall. Give it to me. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm going to keep it hidden under my bedclothes. That will be our secret. Of course. Uh, madam, let me talk to your husband. There's no time to lose. Go right away. Right away. And then all will be well. Certainly. Do not worry. Well, how is she? What do you think? In all truth, monsieur, I fear for her. 
Her pulse is weak, her mind wanders. But I, I have tried my best to give her comfort, days and nights. Yes. We must move her to the hospital. There she will have professional care. Monsieur Le Comte, has anything extraordinary happened to her in the past month? Uh, an apprehension, a fright, some sudden despair? Bless me, no. I can't imagine what it could be. Doctor, we lead a most quiet and judicious life. Nothing but peace and calm rules in this house. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, I shall make the arrangements to have her brought to the hospital today. As you think best, Doctor. I never thought I should live to see such a day. You must calm yourself, mademoiselle. It does no good to dwell upon unhappiness. Uh, young wife, all she wanted was a little joy. That she should sicken and pass away, even in a hospital. Mm. It was a shock to us all. Overnight, she was gone. Was there no way of saving her? One must have the will to live. How long does it take to the cemetery? Not long. Look at him. Up there in the carriage ahead, reining the horses. How stiffly he sits in the coachman's seat. It was his wish to drive the casket coach alone. He has a black heart. Why do you say that, mademoiselle? I have my reasons. He is more troubled than he bargained for. He did not wish even to have a final look at her body. He told me to seal the coffin, and then this morning he would not let the pallbearers touch it. <laughs> He and I alone placed it in his carriage. I believe he is mad. Who else but a mad person would have a rifle beside him in the coachman's seat? Imagine taking a gun to one's wife's funeral. Oh, mademoiselle, there are too many questions and too few answers. What? Stop this coach! <laughs> Count! Count, can you hear me? Count! It... Oh, my God. Oh, God. I knew it. Oh, I knew it. The rifle must have gone off accidentally. The, the horses went wild. Are you sure? The Count's neck is broken. Well, now, my dear, do you feel better telling it all to me? But it is not all. And who better than you to know that? Shall I recall for us the end of the story? Yes, that's the part I most like to hear. The Countess swore truthfully on her crucifix when she said there was no one within the closet, for she knew her house well. As a child, she had played hide-and-seek in that very room of the chateau and knew there was a false panel at the rear of the closet and in back of that, a secret door leading out to the garden. She had only wanted to make certain the young nobleman had found it and escaped when the Count caught her chopping at the brick wall. And he had escaped? Of course. He had no idea the Count deliberately set about to torture her. Being a man of some honor, the Spaniard felt he could not return. The Countess lived through those three weeks and to save her own life, arranged to be taken to the hospital. Dr. Boyer, please sit by me. Closer. I appeal to you. Anything, of course, Josephine. I believe I am married to a wicked, insane man who would stop at nothing to inherit my lands, my wealth, everything. There's nothing I can say to those of the law which would help me. I've decided to forego all my worldly possessions. I will give them up for my freedom. What can I do? Arrange for my death. Josephine, what, what are you saying? There are those who die here, who have not enough money for a respectable funeral. Put one of those unfortunates in a coffin in my name. I, I don't understand. If I leave this hospital and return home, I am as good as dead. He will see to that. What are you saying? Tell my husband I have died. Let him bury the woman in a decent grave, believing it to be me. I don't ask it of any doctor. 
I beg it of the only man I can trust as much as if he were my own father. And so it was done. Twenty years ago. We came here to this same little hotel, from there to the church of St. Magdalene, and were married. Everything that was black turned white. Where there was once darkness, my dearest Carlos, now there was light. Uh, now, my darling, uh, surely you can let the past rest. No, I cannot. All these years we've searched for my son. Where is he? When I saw that boy in the cafe, it brought everything back. Then we must return there. Come along, let us not waste a moment. I shall ask the proprietor, that, that boy, boy who was, who was here. here this morning, eh? Huh? Ah, yes, yes, the young, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Charles. When my wife and I were at that table, he was talking with you. <laughs> Funny you should call my attention to him. He was asking who you were. Does he come here regularly? Oh, three times a week for breakfast coffee. Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, uh, he will be here uh, eight o'clock in the morning, the day after tomorrow. Ah, so shall we be here at that time. so our curtain descends, but not ending the story for all time, rather with a hope that after 20 years, Countess Josephine, now happily married to her Spanish grandee, will perhaps be reunited with her own son. I shall return with a postscript in a moment. All human power is a compound of time and patience. Honoré de Balzac. And to him our thanks for writing this tale. Time and patience did reunite the Countess with her own son, Charles. And you should know that it pleased her that he had no liking for gambling or hunting. Young Charles' only interests were the search for knowledge with which he could help others. And here ends our story. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Roberta Maxwell, William Griffiths, Cork Benson, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.